rock and roll. Well, it's uh, 1.45, so I think we'll go on ahead and get started, unless anyone's waiting for someone to join. All right. Cool. So, uh, hey everyone. My name is Michael. I'm a security consultant down in uh, Seattle, Washington. I work for a company called Deja Vu Security, but I'm re representing them today in absolutely no capacity whatsoever. So you can treat me like garbage, as usual. And um, <laughs> I'm a lawyer. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started here. Uh, set some expectations for this talk right off the bat. Um, so we're not doing anything crazy with this one, right? Like I did not build an extravagant new container system like Firecracker D. Like, we're, we're not doing anything nuts or exciting or anything that has not been mainlined in the kernel since like 2.6 something, right? This is not new stuff. So just want to get that right away. But, you know, there might be some things you haven't heard of yet. If you're, if you're new to Linux, new to Linux security, new to containers, new to container security, hopefully you'll get something out of this. Uh, we're not going too deep, like uh, the container primitives talk that happened yesterday was awesome. We are not going to that depth. So if you're hoping to get like a really detailed rundown of every single layer of the Docker and Linux container security stack, we're not going to get there. And uh, finally, like we're not going too deep into any one thing. So like we're going for a broad survey of all the tools that you might use to deploy something on Linux in like the modern day. So uh, you know we're not we're not going to hit like containers at that depth. We're not going to hit VMs at that depth. So you know if uh, if that doesn't align with you, then uh, you know man, I check traffic. It looks bad. Like I got your back. Get get on out of here before I waste 45 <laughs> minutes of your life. All right. So uh, with that out of the way, uh, let's let's dive right in. So uh, some of the things we're going to hit today, uh, we're going to talk about like Docker, uh, some container stuff. We're going to chat about virtualization. Uh, we're going to talk about some like Linux hardening stuff beyond just like you know set set these file permissions, which I hope you know. Um, and then like we're going to go into some Docker-like things at the very end, you know, stuff like uh, Container D type technologies and the OCI spec. And then uh, just have like you know maybe a couple minutes at the end talk about what's useful where and when and why. So we'll dive right in. So our story today centers around the question raised by this, the PHP hammer. Somebody has written this god-awful PHP app, and suddenly it is your job to deploy this thing. You're not excited about this, but it has happened to you all the same. So you have this PHP app, it's never been pen tested before, you don't know what this looks like, you don't know what your risk exposure is, but you have to get it out there on the network. What do you do? So let's deploy our web app. So we'll start with like, a pretty pretty typical example here. So this is Ubuntu, some recent version, LTS 18, whatever. Uh, so you know we're we're looking at this, yeah, 1804. All right, moving on. We're gonna go ahead and install Apache. You know, make sure we have the, the fundamentals we need to start serving this application. Uh, getting all this installed. I, this is real time. Should have sped this up, but you know we, we learn things every time we speak. Uh, so we're, we're waiting for this. Processing app gets pretty incredible these days, huh? That's awesome. Yeah, thank, I know, right? <laughs> cool. So we have Apache now. Uh, let's go ahead and get uh, make sure it's running. So you know we'll check the system D status, make sure it's alive. It is. That's great. Continuing on, we'll go ahead and uh, get PHP installed. Once again, you know we'll wait for this. Uh, you know, just to reiterate, this is like kind of the typical way, right? Like, you know, if you were deploying something five years ago or whatever, you're deploying something on, you know, the bare operating system, like, this is just what you do, right? Like, you might not have automated with Ansible or something like that, but, you know, you're going through these processes. You're installing the server, doing doing all this stuff. So, finally getting PHP installed. It's on its way. Hotel left that. All right, so now we need to get our app into the directory where Apache knows about it so it can run the PHP files and uh, all this other stuff. So we'll go on ahead and copy uh, the, the application uh, over into that after making sure that that's, that's alive again. All right, there we go. So we verify that Apache is up. Always a good sign. Here we go, here's the demo app. You guys are gonna love this. It's a work of art. All right, here's this. This is this is the art you're, you're about to see in HTML form. Go ahead, check that out, move it over. All right. Mm -hmm. Permission denied because it's uh, thankfully a restricted directory, right? Like anytime we're writing the web dir, sudo it, and 
If I remember correctly, it just works now, which is awesome. There we go. Okay, so we have our, our demo app, right? How fun. This is this is gonna be great. Alright, so like this is awesome because it works. Like we now have a stacked lamp with the, not the MySQL part, but we have the Apache and the PHP. So um, let's go ahead and like check check this out a little bit. Like what what does this do? Let's let's pen test this a little bit because you know we we know there's there's some some shenanigans going on here. So we can kind of scroll around and see see what this thing is like, like some charts and stuff like D3JS or something probably here. Like we, we don't really know what uh what 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 lies in store for us with this PHP app. We'll go ahead and like we'll check the storage. We'll see if it's like setting cookies or something. You know, something that might be scary for us that we can just know about right offhand. There's nothing in local storage. You know, they clearly didn't embrace the, the hipness of Web Web 3.0 or whatever out these days. Uh, we're looking. Nothing in the debugger. Okay. Like let's let's check out some of this JavaScript and see if there's anything like really bad in here. Like some ancient version of jQuery from like 2008 or whatever. Uh, it's fine. You know, it's JavaScript shaped. What we need from this thing these days. Uh, all right, so we'll, we'll keep going. Like maybe we'll try some some more interesting stuff. Let's check out like the login page. Okay, login page is a great great place to start, right? Like probably interfacing with some SQL database. Like let's let's try some crap. Let's see if we can screw up SQL. So we'll go ahead and remember the SQL like payload because it's been like five years since you found one of these in the wild. There we go. Quote semicolon. You remember the stuff. All right, doesn't work. Okay, it's like some guy didn't even wire this up to any logic on the back end. Who would do that? Like 5 a.m. Michael? <laughs> Crazy person. All right, so this isn't really doing anything. Let's check cross-site scripting here, see if we can get anything like injected into this app. Like there's, there's got to be something, right? Like there's, there's no way this thing's safe. Uh, no one even wired this up. Okay, uh, this, this is silly. Maybe we need to create a user first. So let's, uh, let's go and check out like the, the create user flow over here. Uh, check out the register page. All right, um, you know what? I think this is gonna be vulnerable to cross-head scripting. I, I guarantee it, in fact. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna go ahead and get this in here. So this should pop up like a little alert one bar. Oh my god, we won. We have to plan right there. This is basically my everyday job right here. Okay, we got a little privilege. Like, this is sweet, right? Check this out. Okay, and then we get a shell. And this is what shells look like literally anytime you get cross-head scripting, in case, in case you were wondering. That's the joke. All right, so uh, let's investigate just a little bit further. Like, what, what the hell is this that we just got, right? So somehow we got shell in this PHP app with this, like, comical bug. Uh, so let, let's look around our new shell. So you see where we are, see where we're running. Like, what, what's going on with this? All right, can you guys see this okay? I know it's kind of low and, like, I'm going to leave some come down. Uh, if you want to, I'll let you, yeah. All right, so, you know, the first thing we're doing here is we're just, like, checking out, see where we are. Uh, so, who am I? WW the data. Okay, that's good, right? Like, Apache installed with, like, a reasonable user. It's not just running as root, which is pretty sweet. Uh, but, you know, this is, like, the Etsy passwords file for, like, the host. So, that's that's less ideal, you know? Like, it's, it might be running as WW data, but, like, we still have a lot of things that we have access to. Um, you know, we can, we can list and see what's going on, but, like, nothing, nothing really stands out as, like, particularly horrifying. Um, okay, so just to kind of recap what just happened there, we got a shell, whoops, somebody yiped it, and, uh, you know, like, we, we have the shell. So this is great for an attacker, pretty bad for us as defenders. Um, and the, I'll stay a second, like, it's supposed to be a little funny, but, like, let's move beyond the specifics here. And, uh, like, this is obviously a demo, this is kind of a contrived exploit, but it does represent, like, the worst case scenario when you're deploying a web app, right? Which is, like, somebody wrote exec someplace, like, you, you got shell, like, maybe you, I don't know, did some complex attack and became, like, the WordPress admin, suddenly you can load plugins and you're running code on the system. So, like, it's ridiculous, but, like, also a pretty, pretty reasonable attack scenario at the same time. Um, one thing to highlight is this is not always something we can fix. Right? Like sometimes you just have to run arbitrary code, like with the WordPress plugin thing, right? Like you can do stuff to help it, but like sometimes like horrible software is horrible and it's horrible by design and like you still have to run it because it's like a business thing. And even more common than that, you don't even know it's horrible, right? Like before we did this little exercise, like we had no idea that it was actually even this bad. Um, and that's that's really common, right? Like until you have some folks crawling through your thing, you, you don't know that your thing is bad and filled with these like horrifying holes. Um, but like we have to try, right? Like we gotta deploy this thing. So like let's let's talk security for this. Okay. So we know it's bad. We know it's broken. What can we do to fix this? So one thing, just restrict access to it, firewall stuff like that, like network segregation. Keep it keep it off on its own little island in some ways, right? Another way you can do this is like drop some strong auth in front of it. If we have like a really strong username password system and we can limit it only to trusted users inside <clears> of the business or something like that, okay, like that'll that'll reduce the exposure a little bit. 
uh, you know, finally we can just like lock the crap out of this thing and figure out like what what it's doing and hopefully just find all the bugs. But you know, like anyone guess, expensive time, money, whatever else. Um, maybe you can drop something in front of it like a WAF or uh, something else like that. So for those of you who aren't security all day, like web application firewall literally sits in front of your app and says that traffic looks like like uh, malicious. Let's uh, let's let's put the ban hammer down on those packets. So we can do something like that, but like I, as a pen tester, as someone who attacks things, like I can tell you those make my day irritating, but not that much harder. So I, I don't trust them to completely defend my app. Uh, is there anything else we can do? I think we just wait for incident response to handle it, right? Like that's, <laughs> that's another option. <laughs> All right, but like for the sake of it, let's assume the worst. Uh, like this is a business critical app, and uh, like we have to make this available to at least some users internally. Um, like security resources to look at this thing are scant. We don't have a ton of people, and uh, we have to deploy this thing tomorrow when the sun explodes. Like, just the way, the way of the world. Uh, okay, so our new goal, like, for the, the whole purpose of the rest of this talk, is to limit the awfulness that happens if somebody gets remote code execution on this thing we're deploying. And that's really what hardening is, right? Is like limiting the blast radius in the events of a compromise. So, you know, anytime you're hardening your server or whatever else, like, you're assuming that the attacker probably won't get to that stage, right? That's why it's hardening, not like that first line of defense. You're assuming the attacker won't get there, but if they do, you need to make sure they don't get farther. They don't get deeper in your infrastructure. So, let's move on to some more deployment strategies. Up first, the giant container whale, Docker. So, what even is a Docker, you ask? Uh, Docker is a fantastic system for using kernel primitives in Linux to deploy software packages in like a very repeatable, like scalable, fantastic way that's super supported by the community. Everyone loves it, it's great and stuff. All right. So if you've never heard of Docker before, if you have, sorry, tune out for a few minutes, we're given the container ship spiel. Okay, so the container ship spiel. Back when people used to send goods from continent to continent on those, you know, big yieldy ships with massive sails and stuff, right, like, if you just kind of put stuff on the ship, the ship would go to the place, and, like, it was pretty hard to organize all that. Like, I imagine there was some dude's job who was, like, cramming, like, cages with tigers and, like, sacks of potatoes into the hole of these ships or something, right? So then, you know, modern ships came around, we have these containers, like those giant shipping containers you see. You can put whatever in that. It could be like a bunch of angry bees in one, <laughs> and like you know, the potatoes in the other, or a bunch of rubber ducks that like you can use to map the ocean currents sometimes. But the nice thing about them is they make it very, very consistent to like actually manipulate the containers. They can be loaded on the ships, they can be tracked, they can move around, they can be loaded on the semi-trucks. It's very consistent to deploy them, no matter where they're going or what they're up to or what they contain. Another way to look at containers, which is not my favorite, is like as mini VMs. So you get like kind of your own version of the world, you get your own resources, stuff runs in there, can't really get out most of the time, but that's what we're talking about today. Uh, and it's not a very good approximation, but honestly neither is the shipping container thing, because there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of items that reach out into the real world. So, you know, they're both interesting ways to think about Docker, but not, not really all that great. Okay, so uh, why, why would you find yourself using Docker uh, in, in any given situation? Well, for one, it's really easy to deploy complex apps. So like, maybe the developers have this like super crazy dependency tree with like all this like weird stuff and like custom built libraries and whatever. With Docker, like DevOps guy, whoever's deploying, they don't really care. They're just like run, run the container and it runs and that's great. Uh, so you can scale it up and down and there's a bunch of uh, orchestration software around that can support this. So it's, it's pretty easy to deploy stuff. It also adds some degree of isolation between the host and the app, so you don't have to go around with like Chef or Puppet or whatever. Like, making sure all the servers are in state, you just push the container and run it. And it also makes building, testing, and deploying more consistent, because you just push the container and you run it. I think you guys are getting a, that little repetition there. You just run it. Uh, so let's walk through a quick deployment with Docker, and we'll get back to the security side of things in just a minute here. But uh, for now, let's just like kind of focus on the methodology for like publishing one of these things. All right. So. We're gonna go back and we're gonna deploy this application like using using Docker instead of the Apache thing. So starting over back here where you guys can all read at the top of the screen, uh, we're gonna go ahead and make sure Apache's off because we want 480 and if Apache's running 480, we can't use it for like our Docker deployment. So I think it's good and dead. It's, it's dead, that's great. All right, go ahead and clear that out. All right, and back to the source code here. That's that, that beauty you saw earlier, all right there. All right, so we're gonna make sure that Docker runs. Of course it can't because, uh, take a quick aside here, you never want Docker to be able to run as an unprivileged user. If you can run Docker as an unprivileged user, you can actually work your way up to root access. 
Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a bit, but the, the magic is around like being able to use uh, the, the privilege flag in containers. So what I'm up to right here, I wanted to show this whole process because I wanted to show how easy it is, like really from, I want to deploy this with Docker to, I'm deploying this with Docker, is like we're showing the whole thing. So I'm looking up a PHP Docker container that we can grab off Docker Hub. Uh, it's great, so anytime you see that little underscore up there, that means it's something that the, the like Docker folks have been curating, so it's like probably not riddled with malware, which is awesome. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and find that. Ah, there it is, there it is, Apache with PHP, just like baked in, and we're not gonna bother with the Docker file, so we'll go ahead and you know rip, rip this out of the, the docs and we'll run this to, the, to get our app um, in a container and up and running. All right, paste that bad boy in there. So what this will do is it will run our container as a daemon, which means that it will not hang around uh, like for us to interact with. We're gonna expose port 80 to the rest of the world. So inside, whatever it opens with port 80 will be outside, like the host port 80 as well. We're gonna give it a way cooler name, like demo app. And then uh, we're gonna share this volume, which is the current directory, along with the app in it, to var da 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 HTML inside of the container. We're gonna go ahead and run the container. We get permissions there because Docker can't run as a non-root user. We're gonna go ahead and rerun that with sudo, and it starts to pull down all the different layers of the Docker container from Docker Hub. Once again, hotel Wi-Fi. There we go. Okay, so now it's running. This is the image, and. Uh, if I, if I did what I think I did, like the next thing we're gonna do is run Docker PS to make sure that we can actually see this running. There it is, perfect, we have a container ID, uh, all the stuff, this thing on all interfaces, port 80, awesome. All right, let's go find out if it actually works or not. Well, it is, whether or not there. <laughs> Give me just a second here. Yeah, it works, okay. So now we can run who am I again, and check it out. So we're now running in something that looks like basically the same, but you'll notice Etsy password is a little bit different here, right? We don't have all those users that the host machine has. We just have the limited users from the Etsy password inside of the Docker container, specifically that image tracing all the way back down to the Debian one the PHP container is based on. Uh, still can't get Etsy shadow, because we're still running as that dub 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 data user, even inside the Docker container, which is a great feature that I'm glad they finally fixed. Uh, but you know we still have generally the same sort of sort of things. Okay, so now let's go back to the sort of the security stuff. So we can see that the Etsy hosts look a little bit different. That's good, uh, but everything else seemed like kind of the same, right? Because we're still running as a dev dev user, like we're inside of a Debian thing ostensibly, but like, eh. uh, like, but there is actually a lot of stuff that's making this environment significantly safer than the other one. A lot of like kernel level primitives and isolation features that uh, that make it a lot better. So let's compare the two more directly. So like, let's actually go in and uh, set up like a shell inside the container and then set up a shell on the host and we can kind of compare things side by side and see where, where they're at. All right, it's gonna be awesome. So we're gonna run that container again, just uh, you know, from, from here as a root shell, uh, run bash IT means give me an interactive terminal, we're gonna run bin bash, or sorry, IT means interact with the thing I'm about to run. So inside the container, we're gonna run bin bash. There we go, all right, with the container. So now we're running as root this time, which is a little bit different, right? We're root inside the container. So this is perhaps a, a better simulation of like, somebody attacked, they got in, they got into the container, and then they privileged us up the root. So now over here, now we're running as root on the host. <coughs> okay, so we have the container and the host. So the host is running Ubuntu 18.04, long-term support, and the container is running debut new Linux 9. All right, so like we can see that they have different versions of what operating system to run, even though they are technically using the same kernel, which is interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, back to the same thing, Etsy password. It's just a good way to reinforce the, the distinction. Like, they are not the same. This is the host. This has all the like normal Ubuntu things. That is the stripped down version of Debian the container is running. Different files. <coughs> so we have that isolation in there. Inside the container, there's like two processes running. Basically nothing. But on the host, all sorts of processes are running, including, as you're about to see, the container. <laughs> so if we look at the Apache process inside of Ubuntu here, and quickly forget how keyboards work, <laughs> you can see that uh, we have the Docker invocation here and a lot of these other Apache-related processes. So some of those are the hosts, which I never actually killed, I think, or I actually did. So those are all, all related to the container itself. Uh, next thing, we can check out like the, the block devices that the container can see. 
uh, and like what is mounted. So we just ran mount, so if you couldn't see that command in time. And uh, it has like a very different version of that than the host does. If we run the block devices on the host, we can see a lot of different things. It's still pretty pared down because it's a VM that I created like yesterday. But um, you know, it's, it's, it's still got more and more things. I can see more. I can see more of the uh, virtual box or uh, rather VMware like devices and such. Um, so let's, let's do another quick experiment here, right? So like if we run update, we're gonna go ahead and grab the command netcat. And if we open a low numbered port on the container, Let's see if we can you know, actually open a low-numbered port on the host, which would be interesting, right? So if we, inside the container, if we can open some port and masquerade as the host, because they're the same machine, right? Like they're running the same kernel. That would be interesting. So if we can open something less than 1024, like maybe we're violating some sort of like uh, privileges or something. So interestingly enough, we see when we try to open port 55 inside of the container, uh, we actually open port 34395. So back on the host, if we you know run and see what the IP address is for the container picture, uh, we can try to interact with it and see if it actually opens you know whatever three four three nine five or if it opened port fifty five as, as we'd hoped. So let's go ahead and try to access that using netcat, Swiss Army knife of networking. Uh, there we go, and uh, we see it's not working. Let's get a little bit more clarity as to why. Failed, connection refused, so that certainly makes it look like 34395 is actually the port that was open, despite our expectations. So let's try that out. There it goes, and it works. So that means that the container cannot actually open those low numbered ports as we would have assumed when we ran that command. Uh, this is you know, important for security, because if a container can open port 80 and override the host's port 80, that would be bad. So another interesting thing that you cannot do from inside the container, you can't like read with the computer. However, if you run that from the host, it actually works. <laughs> so <laughs> as I mentioned, Docker is run using uh, a bunch of like underlying kernel primitives. Uh, so one of those is namespaces. Namespaces separate processes from parts of the system. So like, for example, the network namespace provides a different version of the Linux networking stack to one of the, the, the processes, right? So like. Uh, we can say, hey, this is your version of the, the networking stack to a particular process, separating it from the other one so that it, you know, the, the containerized thing doesn't interact with the host. It can't like, change the Wi-Fi network, it can't you know, change its MAC address, whatever. Uh, it, it's just separated, right? So uh, these are namespaces that like, are used for Docker by the kernel. So we have like C groups, uh, which is C group namespace, distinct from C groups. We have uh, IPC, network, mounts, like PID namespace, so it can interact with all the other processes on the host, which is important because we want to keep it isolated. And for, you know, we want it to think it's in its own world or leak information about the host. And then we also have like a user namespace, so it can't interact with other users. We're not going to dig into these a ton right now. We'll get more into them later when we're talking about some of the Linux security because I don't want to conflate the Linux security and Docker security. Even though they're related, they are distinct, so we'll wait to talk about some of these until later. Uh, but there are some other primitives that we will need. Uh, so one of those is C groups. C groups is basically used to prevent the process from being real scumbags and using all the CPU or memory or anything else in the host. So uh, they have C groups uh, has subsystems which are implementations that actually monitor resource usage or monitor anything really. Um, C groups is used to categorize processes. And when I was reading the Wikipedia page for this, I had no idea. Turns out you can actually use it for billing. So if you ever want to start your own cloud provider, you can use C groups to bill people, which is pretty fun. <laughs> Um, and then Docker uses C groups mostly to make sure that you know one container doesn't just like eat everything or like re-nice itself to you know own the world or something, and uh, just make sure nobody nobody really gets out of hand. Uh, one final thing we're going to talk about here is the the union file system that's required for Docker. So Docker is pretty sweet in that it can save on space. So like we have base images, which are the file system that a given container uses. Like there's an Ubuntu base image, like a Fedora one, or like an Alpine, whatever whatever you like. And uh, as soon as that is used with another one, we can write files, but it will preserve that underlying uh, version of the file system so it can be used by other containers. So th like three, four, n containers can reference the same base file system. And each have their own version stacked on top of that. Uh, check out the Linux yeah. Check out that Linux container privileges talk of yesterday if you want to know like way more about this. But uh, overlayfs is really cool. Uh, and uh, we're not going to talk about it too much here because the uh, security implications are not as immediate as some of the other things, but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty rad. All right, so let's talk about like the threat model with Docker. So first things first, Docker is definitely not a VM, and uh, we definitely have like a shared processor, we have shared hardware, uh, it's, all, it's all right there. Even worse, we're actually sharing a kernel. So like a kernel exploit means that if you, you know, can get 
get a kernel module loaded or some, some type of RCE in the kernel, you win. You get the host, the whole thing, right? So even if you are inside a container, you, get out, you can get the entire host. You can start launching attacks on other infrastructure, you're on the network, you, you just win, right? Um, and other ways, that, or other ways things can go badly, uh, you can run containers with the host network stack directly. So if you, you can ask Docker to not create a namespace for the networking stack. So if you do dash dash net host, you're just using the host network stack. And then the container has a lot more flexibility and freedom to do whatever it would like with the networking stack in Linux. Uh, you can also do things like uh, run containers that share way too much of the host file system. And uh, I, I'm sure you're laughing right now, right? Like, who would share, like, slash with the container? That, wouldn't that just break it? No, people do it frequently. And uh, you, it turns out that means you can wander through and, like, you know, get things in proc or, like, check out Etsy passwords or Etsy shadow because most of the time you're in a container, you're running as root. So you can get access to a lot of these things that you would not expect when people don't think before sharing volumes with the container. Uh, so with all this in mind, like, let's see how we fare. So the most uh, simple deployment with Docker still buys us a few nice things. We get that file system isolation. So you know, if we break out, we break into the container, uh, we still can't you know, go anywhere we want on the system, right? Like we're still inside of a virtual file system. That's good. Uh, we get thorough process isolation, so we can't see everything that's happening on the host. If there are other important processes running on there, like I don't know, like a secret storage server or something like that, like we can't see that unless we get an, a kernel exploit. And you know, kernel exploits happen, but they're not super common, right? Like I can't just reach in my pocket and find you another dirty cow. So uh, that's that's something. We also can't open low number ports, which is another great feature for the, the security of the situation. And um, you know, one thing to consider though is typically when we're inside the container, we are running as some type of root user. So you know, you can still still do some things. Can we do better? Obviously, yes. Or I wouldn't be asking that question right now. Um, so let's talk about setcomp. Setcomp is this fantastic system which you can use to restrict the system calls that can be made from inside the container. The purpose of this is to limit the kernel's exposure to the untrusted process in the container. Uh, so, like by default, there's somewhere like 300 system calls ish. Uh, Docker blocks like 45 ish of them, uh, just because there's no re need to run those. So, like mount, mount can't be run uh, according to the default set comp whitelist for Docker. So you can't like reboot your machine, you can't mount new things, you can't access the kernel's key ring. All these are just like part of Docker's default set comp list. So it protects the, the host uh, from the container just using that list of by filtering system calls. Um, it also helps avoid like leaking information from the container or from the host to the container by limiting things like ptrace, the stuff you can use to introspect the kernel and see what it's up to. Um, yeah, so setcomp is awesome. Uh, another thing we can use is user namespaces. So uh, I just copied this doc here because I could not think of any way to summarize this more succinctly. But uh, you can map the root user inside of your container to a like non-existent or very low privilege user outside of it, such that if the, the container ever gets access to something outside of the container, it will be running as this really high numbered untrusted user that can't do anything. So that's another excellent feature we can do. Pretty, pretty straightforward to set up. You add like a JSON file into the Docker daemon. Another thing we can do is add capabilities to like granularly manage what the things inside of the container can do. For example, like if we were to do like uh, cap add, sysboot, Ubuntu, bin bash, and like suddenly that reboot example with some modifications could work and the container could reboot the host. Uh, I know what you're thinking, that's terrible, why would you ever want that? I wouldn't, but you can, there are other capabilities that are important, like net admin. So if you need to open like low number ports, you can pass the like sysnet binds low number ports service something, whatever that capability is, you can pass that to the container without using the net host or without using privilege. So you can, you know, relegate it permissions based on like a one by one basis instead of just giving it keys <coughs> All right, now let's switch gears quite a bit and talk about virtualization for a little bit. Uh, I'm imagining that most of you here are probably pretty familiar with the concept of like VMs and virtualization, but we'll skim over it anyway. Uh, so virtualization for just containers. So over here, if we have a containerized application, these are like the containers, they interact with Docker which is sort of a little bit of a layer, but not much of one between that and the host operating system. So we have like bare metal, the kernel, and then like the container stuff. Virtualization, the way it works is we have a hypervisor, which simulates hardware, and that in turn runs different virtual machines. So that means that each virtual machine is running its own version of the kernel and whatever else apps inside of that. So it's virtualizing everything to the machine, not just exposing a kernel that it can call. So one thing we'll talk about here is Chemu. 
uh, which I learned, I've done doing research for the stock, stands for Quick Emulator. Who knew? Um, so what this does is it emulates the processor, it emulates the motherboard, it emulates the network stack, all the devices that you need to have a running the machine. Uh, and it runs all of this virtualization inside of a single process on the host, which is something I feel like is overlooked way too much. That is so cool that we can create a computer inside of a process on a computer. Um, <laughs> I think it's Steve. Anyway, uh, so what it means is you're not just stuck using x86 or whatever your processor is, you can actually emulate other processors. That's the MU bit of QMU. Uh, so you know we can emulate ARM if we're on x86 or do any, any number of crazy awesome things. Uh, so like, QMU is used all over the place. It's used in places that seem like they would be competitors to QMU. For example, VirtualBox uses some like hardware from QMU, which I did not realize. Anyway, uh, running a VM with QMU, uh, this is going to be the most exciting demo you've seen all day. Uh, it doesn't even really work. <laughs> uh, I'll show you why in a second. Uh, but like, so you know, we can create like a little uh, block device here, which is going to act like the hard drive for the virtual machine, uh, and then we can we can run this. So it's just checking. It's like a QCow compressed image like version of the block device that we're about to load in the VM. All right. So now uh, this is like saying like run x86 processor with like you know a gig of memory ish and like booting the thing, whatever, booting the hard drive, share the network with the, with the user, whatever, because it doesn't really matter right now, uh, run that, and behold, we have Ubuntu running at the pace that emulating x86 inside of an existing VM, which this is, on my MacBook will take us. So I'm not even going to finish this, because it, it just, it will load eventually. It does work, but it is so slow. Uh, so this was a great idea. Um, but uh, eventually, you know, we're, we're just going to need to move on with our day here. <laughs> All right, so um, what if you're virtualizing an x86 machine on an x86 machine, like we are here, uh, with QMU there is a way you can actually do that. So Intel, I, I think there are other competitors that do as well, but they have this uh, thing, uh, X, or VTX, which allows you to run a certain set of instructions on the actual metal, right? So you, you don't need to emulate the processor anymore, you can just send those commands to the processor. It'll run those at the speed of the hardware, and then get back to the process with the result of that which means you get like massive performance enhancements there. Uh, so this leads us to KVM, because you can't just do that from user space, right? You can't just like randomly shatter with the CPU in, a, in an unprotected way from, from user space. So KVM ripped out <coughs> chunks of QMU that are responsible for this virtualization and uh, exposed that to user land via system calls. So what this means is QMU can actually call those and use things like VTX from user space, which means your VMs can now go like blazingly fast, sort of, for VVM. <laughs> Um, but now you're like, okay, this is great and whatever, but like I get VMs and like where, where's the security? Man, this is the only reason I'm at this talk. Uh, turns out KVM and KMU are really, really, really well tested. Like it's hard to find a better way to isolate a thing from other stuff on your system than virtualizing QMU and KVM. I've spent four months like looking intensely at QMU source code and we found like four partial exploits, right? Like it's, it's tested. It's awesome. Um, so like the things inside of VMs are actually way farther away from the hosts and other things than you would expect and it means that when you exploit the thing you're running inside of the VM, you only get access to the VM. You don't get access to the rest of the network, you don't get access to the, the hosts or anything else. So when a VM is in play, it adds another layer to the attacker's exploit. Uh, it means they have to get out of the VM as well, which is really, really not something that you just do. Like if you get a VM escape, like report that to someone, like you found a cool bug. Like even if someone used it on you, you're like, sweet. <laughs> um, all right, so let's, like speaking of that deployment, uh, if you're deploying with a VM, one thing that kind of sucks about VMs is it's just like a normal host, right? Like you still have to do whatever you were doing deployment-wise before Docker. So that's like Chef or Puppet or like SSHing in to like manually configure everything. Like that, you still have to do all that stuff, which sucks. Like you can automate a little bit of it with like lib D or something like that. So like manage bringing them up and down and like scaling and configuration, but it's still mostly manual. Like you have to use something like Ansible or Chef or whatever to, to make that happen. Um, and in some other places, like the VMs fall down a little bit. VMs are like really heavy because you're emulating another machine. Even if you're like making the processor be shared with the real one, you're still emulating like the BIOS, the network card, like a bunch of other stuff, right? There's a lot of, a lot of bookkeeping there that your computer has to do for almost no reason. Uh, also, unlike Docker, like there's just not as much magic around the deployment side, right? Like with Docker, you're just like, oh, Docker pull thing, Docker run thing, it's up and running. With VM, you have to pull it down and solve all the same manual stuff. Um, yeah, but you know, plus sides, if you break out, you're in a VM instead. 
Uh, one other thing to consider is like, if you break out into the VM, you're still in the VM though. And I, I kept saying that like it's a good thing, but it's also a really bad thing because it means the VM is attached to the other stuff and you can you know, work your way up to root and you have access to, the, to like the networking stack inside the VM, which is still on something privileged probably. So that's not great. But that does lead us to hardening Linux. So presumably you're deploying Linux as your virtualized operating system. So one thing you need to do to make sure that if you break out into the VM, it still isn't as bad, is to actually harden the Linux distro that you're virtualizing. Uh, why, do you ask? Because like ultimately, this is like the ultimate point of trust for this whole setup, right? Like you're running on Linux at some level, you're gonna have to harden the Linux so they can't get any further. Uh, an attacker can work their way from the host down into the VM if they have access to that, and they can start working their way up from the VM up, probably, uh, at least on some time scale, if, they, uh, if, they, if that isn't secured. So all that work is for naught if you don't like actually harden Linux as well. So we'll quickly give some service to like the, the, the normal stuff you do to harden Linux, right? Like make sure your file permissions are locked down. I think it's 777, kind of look at that. You're like, does it need to be? Really? So you know, do do all that stuff. Like it's so, don't forget about it. Uh, good passwords, right? Like if you, someone can rip Etsy Shadow out and like brood all your passwords, that's a bad time. Uh, check out your firewalls, right? If you just like open the world, that's a bad place to be. Who knows what could happen to you then? Uh, make sure everything's updated, all the packages are installed. Like you don't want to have like Uncle Ted's Netcat version with like Dashy enabled, uh, you know, running on your production server. And once again laugh and sticker. It totally happens. People have really dumb stuff deployed on their like production boxes. Um, and then you want to make sure your applications aren't running as root. So like uh, making sure Apache is not running as root. And uh, I, I don't know about you guys, but to me that feels like a 2008 thing. Like yeah, yeah, we get it, we know. But like it's something you still totally see. Like even in modern pen test gigs, like people run services as root because they don't realize there's a more granular way to run those services without providing like full keys of the kingdom root access to the service. Um, yeah, so all that stuff is like pretty pretty typical. But let's talk about some more exciting things. I'm not gonna talk about all these, but like briefly touch on mandatory access control. This is so cool. Like you can use things like Tomio to like develop a pro like a profile of what your app is supposed to use in the system. Like block devices, system calls, whatever else, and it will learn what is supposed to be used there, and it can filter everything that's outside of that profile. That's sweet, right? Like it's like setcomp, but it just learns itself for you. Uh, you can use capabilities, right? Like, we're gonna talk about these more in a second, so maybe I won't talk about capabilities and namespacing right now. Uh, just like, give me like 10 seconds. And then uh, we can also use like SE Linux and LSMs, like Linux security modules. They'll can provide like very deep, detailed auto logging of everything that's happening inside of the kernel, the operating system as a whole. We can, we can have great visibility and, you know, possibly use that to lock it down once we know what normal looks like. And then the whole other sphere of like secure and trusted boot stuff, which we won't even touch on, that can really prevent like physical attacks or make it very expensive. All right, so let's uh, let's talk about namespaces for a second, right? Namespaces allow you to separate the version of every, the world, really, the process sees versus what the host sees. So one thing we can do is restrict the network with namespaces. So back to back to our trusty VM here. Uh, let's do a quick example where we restrict the uh, processes like internet access. So. Uh, using some of these commands, we can give it a completely different network stack. So, oh man, I didn't zoom in. Sorry, guys. All right, so uh, that's me pinging Google, indicating the internet works, which is great. Uh, this is me typing IP in NetNS, which is uh, network namespace add sandbox. This creates a new network namespace named sandbox. Then what we do is we can execute uh, inside of the sandbox namespace bin bash. So what we have now is a bash shell uh, that is running inside a network namespace. We can look at like the IP address and the IP links, and we see there's only that loopback interface, which is like pretty weird, right? But since we haven't added any interface to this namespace, the internet doesn't work for this namespace specifically. So for this one process, this one bash and its children here, they cannot access the internet. It just doesn't work for them, like enforced by kernel rules. If we uh, exit back out, we can see that once again, the internet works. Pretty cool, right? Like if you need to quarantine some untrusted code for a, a quick thing, uh, that's, a, that's one way to do it. Uh, another thing we can do is use capabilities to give something the ability to run at a higher level of privilege, but only in a certain way. So an infamous example is the ping command. You can run ping because it's set UID, even though it requires like raw packet forming. You can run ping from any user on the system, typically. But uh, it does that by granting you full root access. So if you exploit ping, might be hard to do, but like could happen, right? If you exploit ping, you could suddenly have set UID like root privileges throughout the entire system. That's a lot of exposure for ping. So one thing we could do is use uh, capabilities to allow us to set specific 
privileges for that thing. So here, this is like a really simple C program we wrote that is going to listen on port 55. So it's a low number port, right? So it's below 1024. So we can't just do this. We have to be privileged in some way to allow this to happen. So we compile it. Give it a go. All right. And now we try to run it. About to do right now. There we go. We get permission denied. Bind failed. You can't bind to that port. It's too. It's a privileged port. So we can check the capabilities that are associated with the file a dot out, and uh, we get nothing because there's no capability associated with it. So now we can set cap net bind service. Uh, we can say effective and teaming uh, on a dot out. Can't do that. We're not root. We act as root, so we can can assign those uh, permissions to it. Then if we run it, it actually runs. And suddenly, without using set UID, without giving this thing full root file system permissions, uh, we can run like this thing that listens on a low number port. Once again, we can see there it is, cap that bind service, applies the port. If we remove it and try running it again, which is about to happen after we finish removing it. Yep. So now there's no permission associated with it and it fails again. So using like capabilities, we can set this very granular access to like privileged system calls, right? Which is awesome. Um, yeah, duplicate that slide. All right, so we only have a few minutes left here, so we're gonna move along to some things that are like Docker, uh, based on the uh, Open Containers Initiative, and uh, some other like cool hybrids. Uh, so the Open Container Initiative is like a Linux Foundation thing, but in my mind at least, I don't know if this is actually the truth of the matter, so take it with a grain of salt, but like that sort of spot out of Docker. Like everyone's like, Docker is sweet, but we want to be able to do our own. So Linux Foundation has the Open Container Initiative, uh, which allows a lot of that stuff to be standardized. So Docker, the company, gave the Open Container Initiative a chunk of their product, which is uh, Run C. So Run C is the implementation that actually makes the containers happen, right? It spins up the containers and gets all the <coughs> capabilities and namespacing and C groups set up for the container and actually runs it. Does the, does the legwork there for, for Docker. Uh, Run C is now the reference implementation for uh, OCI and it defines how container backends operate. So like, if you want to make it compliant, make it support the things Run C does. Uh, why do we care? Uh, since this is the part that actually spins up the containers and everything, it's decoupled from the front end so that Docker interface command line that you know and love can be used to spin up other things. So I was talking with a few folks here that were just the firecracker uh, talk, which is also awesome, and you should totally go find that uh, once the videos are up online. Um, but uh, we can do some like pretty cool stuff here. So instead of just running like a normal Docker container, maybe we can run like a VM with a Docker container inside of that. So we get like some of the benefits of like containers and VMs. So we can get the security of both. Maybe we can re-implement Run C to like spin up containers with like crazy paranoid settings. I don't know. The, world, the world's your oyster as long as you have time to write the thing. Uh, so here's some like pretty sweet, approximately OCI compatible projects. Uh, one of them is Run C, which is reference implementation. So I guess that is exactly OCI compatible. Uh, we also have Run SC and Gvisor, which are the same thing. This is a Google product. I believe is used in production. Uh, we'll talk more about this in just a second. Uh, there's also Run Q, which uh, spins up a Qemu VM for the Docker container. Uh, so like it'll spin up uh, the container, run the VM inside of that, and the process inside of that. So you get all the isolation that can you provide, but like the approximate interface of normal Docker, which is pretty sweet. Uh, there's Kata, which I don't know very much about, but does about the same thing in a slightly more extensible and granular way. And then uh, there's Firecracker, which is not exactly OCI compliant, as we just learned, but um, is actually pretty cool. I really look forward to seeing what that project ends up. So just to show you of how easy it is to get these OCI runtimes uh, in place when they're actually well documented, uh, I'm going to go ahead and get Gvisor set up here. So while this is happening, I'll just talk a little bit about Gvisor. Uh, this is basically Google's re-implementation of most of the Linux system call interface implemented in Go, uh, running as a service. So basically what this will do is instead of exposing the system calls made inside of your container to your kernel, it will instead hit this Go implementation provided by Google, which will do some basic filtering uh, for you. And so if you trust that implementation more, or think it's just an extra abstraction layer that protects your kernel from the untrusted stuff in the container, uh, that's, a, that's a real win for security. So, uh, let's see. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and grab this uh, run at C binary that they provided for us. It's all Go, it's got to be linked, it's awesome. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and move that into uh, user bin so we can call it or use a local bin, hard to choose sometimes, right? All right, move it there. Make sure it's executable for everyone on the system. I think 
really hard about what we're going to type next. <laughs> All right, and then we're going to add the configuration that will allow the Docker daemon to understand that there is a different implementation of run C that it can now use. We're going to rip this out of the docs here, run times uh, the path to the thing. Plop that in there. <coughs> And suddenly, actually, after we reload Docker, it has to be aware of this configuration change. So we're going to reload the, the Docker service. All right. Now, in theoretical, we can run Docker with this different runtime. So this is just like a, a standard, like with the with the normal Docker run C runtime. And if we add uh, runtime run SC, which is the, the Gvisor one, it just works just, just the same, right? So uh, it's a completely normal version of Docker, it just it happens to be running with this like really cool Go filter in front of all system calls. Uh, so we can see it's running Gvisor, starting Gvisor. I don't know if you can read that back in the cheap seats, uh, but uh, it, it is. Uh, so uh, yeah, that just works pretty much exactly the way you'd expect. And like that was the entire thing from like, I have Docker installed to I want Gvisor. Like that, that, that span of time is all it took to get it running with that. All right, so now what? We are one and a half minutes over time. Sorry if you are trying to drive home. Uh, but now that we've discussed a lot of these different things, like what what can you do? Uh, like is there is there a way to deploy this that like, I recommend or is like the best? And of course the answer is it depends. <laughs> like it depends what your threat model is. It depends how much time and money you have to throw at deploying your thing. Right, like uh, maybe this Gvisor thing is actually really freaking awesome and totally manages, like matches your use case, but maybe it's too alpha for you, right? Like Google's using it in prod, but that doesn't mean you can, because it, it could still have like a lot of a lot of overhead to support it. Uh, maybe you just want to do VMs because it's the, the safest option, right? Like you have an ESXi cluster, or you have like a bunch of KVM stuff. Like maybe you just want to use that. I don't know. Uh, maybe you just want to use raw containers. And I feel like this is a completely reasonable option that is too frequently overlooked. Like, we trust the Linux kernel to secure us from so many other things. Like, it's a shame that we cannot at any time trust it to isolate processes, right? Like, when we trust it with C-groups, when we trust it with namespacing, like, it's still the kernel, right? Like, we, we trust the Linux kernel for so much, just we're not willing to trust it with that. And there's a good reason. It wasn't designed in that way. It hasn't been hardened in that way for, you know, the, 20 plus years or whatever that Linux has been in service. So there's a good reason for that. And you know, if you're running critical financial data or like social security numbers like next to completely untrusted code, maybe that's not enough of a security boundary. But uh, if you're just running like a Plex server at home or something, right? Maybe it's fine. Maybe maybe that Docker provided isolation is actually enough. Uh, and you know, the one cool alternative, right, is uh, sandbox containers. So like things like Runku, Mercata, and you know, maybe maybe later once it's more mature, Firecracker would be a pretty free way to do that. And then the other option, which uh, we haven't talked about at all, because it's less interesting, because someone else is doing it for you, you can use a cloud. Like, I can say with a weird amount of certainty that AWS is very, very good at protecting their infrastructure. And uh, if you don't have the time to like, you know, figure out how you want to implement all this stuff, like, maybe you check out them, maybe check out DigitalOcean or someone else. Because uh, they, they are able to do a lot of this uh, in bulk for everybody. So this is all mostly centered around you, you need to deploy something on your, your server, but if you don't have to, it's something to think about. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. So, uh, do you guys have any questions? Yeah? So you mentioned for mandatory access control there was some tool to profile uh, what is needed, what was that? Oh yeah, so uh, there's a lot of different versions of mandatory access control for Linux. And if you guys need to go, definitely don't waste people like, like to get a GitLab and stuff. Um, but uh, there's a bunch of different types of mandatory access control for Linux. Uh, one I was specifically referring to is called Tomio. Tomio, yeah, um, and that, that one has like a learning mode that uh, it'll like watch all the system calls you provide, add it onto a file, and you can use that as configuration. Uh, I would totally recommend checking that one out. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Anyone else? Have you ever used Firejail? I have not used Firejail. In fact, I haven't either. either. Okay. I've heard of it. It seems like kind of in between a container. And that, but yeah, I will totally yeah. check out that after this talk. Yeah. Sweet. Anyone else? Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming.